Hello everyone, we're here at the White House today for a very unique event, an exclusive interview with President Obama uh, in which the questions come from American people who've submitted them and chosen them online. Uh, my name is Steve Grove and I'm the head of news and politics at YouTube. Mr. President, thank you for taking time to answer these questions today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me and thanks to YouTube for doing this. We had a chance to do this uh, before I was elected and had a great time, so I'm glad we can do it again. Great. Well, let's tell people a little bit about how this works. Um, five days ago, um, as you were delivering your State of the Union address, we opened up our moderator platform on YouTube, where thousands of people have been submitting and voting on both video and text questions. Some of them, as you'll see, were hard-hitting, others were emotional, some were even funny. But all of the questions you'll see here today were voted into the top tier of the thousands of questions we received, and none of them have been chosen by the White House or seen by the President. So this should be a lot of fun. Uh, Mr. President, let's let Layman Marcus from Sing Silver Spring, Maryland kick us off. Uh, he submitted this video to remind us of where things were a year ago. So let there be no doubt, health care reform cannot wait, it must not wait, and it will not wait another year. <laughs> Mr. Marcus writes, Mr. President, I know there have been political setbacks to getting health care reform done. The 40 million people who have no insurance can't wait. Will they be able to get insurance this year? Uh, it is my greatest hope that we can get this done, not just a year from now, but soon. Uh, we came extremely close. We now have a bill that's uh, come out from the House, come out from the Senate. That's unprecedented. Uh, and if you look at the core components of uh, that legislation, what you have is 30 million people who get coverage, uh, insurance reform, so the people who have health insurance are going to be able to be protected from uh, not being able to get it because of pre-existing conditions or uh, suddenly losing their health care because uh, you know the insurance company has some fine print that they didn't read. Uh, it makes sure that we actually start uh, bending the cost curve, controlling the rise in premiums by instituting better practices in terms of how we reimburse doctors and how we uh, ask hospitals to work together. We've already invested in uh, electronic IT, uh, electronic medical records, things that can help make uh, the system more efficient. So we have this enormous opportunity, but the way the rules work in the United States Senate, you've got to have 60 votes for everything. Uh, after the special election in Massachusetts, we now only have 59. Mm -hmm. uh, we are calling on our Republican colleagues to get behind a serious health reform bill, one that actually provides not only the insurance reforms for people who do have health insurance, but also the coverage for folks who don't. Uh, my hope is, is that they accept that invitation and that they work uh, with us together over the next uh, several weeks to get it done. You know, a lot of people that submitted questions that were sort of frustrated with the process yeah. of, of all of health care. And the number one question we got in health care came from Mr. Anderson who te in Texas who asked, why are the health care meetings and procedures not on C-SPAN as promised? And then one of the top questions in the government reform category was Warren Hunter in Brooklyn who said, how do you expect people in this country to trust you when you've repeatedly broken promises that were made on the campaign trail, most recently the promise to have a transparent health care debate? Well, I, I guess, first of all, I would say that we have been certified by independent groups as the most transparent White House in history. It's important to understand. We are the first White House since the founding of the Republic to list every visitor that comes into the White House uh, online so that you can look it up. Uh, people know more about the inner workings of this White House, the meetings we have. Uh, we've excluded lobbyists from boards and commissions, uh, but we also report on any lobbyist who meets with anybody who's part of our uh, part of our, our administration. So we've actually followed through on a lot of the commitments that we've made, and so Warren's uh, mistaken in terms of how he uh, characterized it. What is fair to say is that uh, as the health care process went forward, not every single aspect of it was on C-SPAN. Now keep in mind, most of the action was in Congress. So mm -hmm. every committee hearing that was taking place, both in the House and the Senate, those were all widely televised. Uh, the only ones that were not were meetings that I had with some of the legislative leadership, 
uh, trying to get a sense from them in terms of what it was that they were trying to do. I think it is a fair criticism. I've acknowledged that. Uh, and that's why, as we move forward, making sure that in this last leg, that these last five yards before we get to the goal line, that everybody understands exactly what's going on in the health care bill, that there are no surprises, no secrets. That's going to be an imperative. It's going to be one of my highest priorities. Well, you know, the central focus of your State of the Union was obviously jobs. And a lot of people wrote in asking for some clarity around some of your plans for small businesses. Yeah. I'm going to play you two video questions in a row. Mm -hmm. Good evening, President Obama. One year ago today, my wife and I were both let go from our jobs in corporate America within 48 hours of each other. We've since started a small business, and we employ a couple of people around us. What is being done to free up funding and encourage the growth of other small businesses that have such a tremendous impact in our economy? Thank you. Colin Callahan, Costa Mesa, California. Mr. President, how exactly are you planning on helping small businesses grow and prosper besides simply providing tax breaks? Well, uh, let me start with uh, some specific issues that confront every small business all across the country. And it's absolutely true that if we can get small businesses back on their feet, then that's going to go a long way towards uh, bringing the unemployment rate down because uh, that's the fastest generator of jobs across the country. Uh, number one, small businesses really are still struggling with financing. Uh, you, you hear stories everywhere you go that even profitable, successful businesses are having trouble uh, getting financing because banks, frankly, just don't want to take the risk. Mm -hmm. After having taken way too many risks before, now they're taking no risk, and small businesses uh, are punished for that. So we've expanded the, the SBA loan, the Small Business Administration loan portfolio, by about 70 percent. We've been waiving guarantees and fees, trying to streamline the process just to get more capital into the hands of small businesses. That's point number one. Point number two, then, are the tax breaks that uh, were alluded to. It is important to see if we can give uh, more incentives to small business. So, for example, we're just eliminating capital gains for small businesses, which is particularly important. If you've got a startup, 10 years from now, you may end up uh, being successful with your small business, but suddenly you've got to pay taxes on it. If you can take that money and instead of paying Uncle Sam, reinvest it in your business, you can grow it further. So we think that that's uh, the kind of strategy that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we want to also uh, make sure that we're providing tax credits for hiring of small business, uh, uh, small businesses that are hiring mm -hmm, new employees. Right, right. Uh, and so we've got a whole range of proposals there. Now, in addition to the tax credits, in addition to the financing, uh, one of the other things that, frankly, small businesses need is just uh, an economic environment uh, that is growing. And one of the things we're very proud of is the fact that we had a 6% contraction of the economy at the beginning of last year. This past quarter, we had a 6% increase in the growth of the economy. That 12% swing offers greater opportunities for small businesses uh, to prosper and thrive. Last point I'd make, one of the biggest burdens on small businesses is health care costs. And probably nobody benefits more from our health care proposals than small businesses. Because what we're doing is we're saying that not only will you get tax credits, to buy health insurance, but we're also going to let you pool, buy into a big exchange so that you have the same purchasing power as a big company like uh, Ford or, or uh, you know, Google is able to, to negotiate with insurance companies and get a good deal. Well, now small businesses, by pooling together in this uh, exchange, are going to have that same leverage. That will help lower their costs. And for a lot of small businesses, it's not just a matter of giving health insurance to your employees. It's also just being able to buy health insurance for yourself. That will cut down on small businesses' costs, and they'll be able to, again, invest more in their business. You know, a lot of Americans saw what happened on Wall Street this past year. Mm -hmm. And they wrote in saying, when are we going to get our bailout? Right. Um, here is Frederick from Florida, who submitted the number one video question in the financial reform category. Mm -hmm. Mr. President. My name is Frederick from South Florida. I have a question about your HAMP program and why the banks are reluctant to modify loans for homeowners who can afford to stay in their homes. Now the taxpayers bail them out. They refuse to help us out. And I would like to know what say you, Mr. President. Well, look, this is something that we've been 
uh, dealing with since the beginning of this financial crisis. Uh, we set up a program for loan modification uh, that so far about four million people have taken advantage of uh, across the country. You've got about 800,000 people who've gotten loan modifications that are saving them an average of $550. And so these are not insignificant savings. We've been able to get that done. The problem is, is the, the number of people whose mortgages are underwater, where they uh, actually have a home value that's now less than their mortgage, uh, is a lot bigger than that. And you, know, you saw declining values all across the country. So uh, the amount of money that we've been able to uh, get into this program has not met the entire need. We're now pushing the banks as hard as we can to make sure that not only uh, do they uh, do the most with the resources that we've been giving them, but that they also uh, do a much better job of customer service with people who are coming to them. I get letters all the time of people who've gone through all kinds of hoops, filled out forms, the bank doesn't call them back, or after they've gone through a trial period, the bank says, well, you know, we now think we shouldn't give you a home modification. What we're trying to do is to increase transparency and force all the banks to tell us exactly what are you doing with your customers who want to stay in their homes, can't afford to pay a mortgage, but need uh, something a little bit more mm -hmm. limited. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to continue to see more and more people take advantage of it. But I, I want to be honest, uh, given the magnitude of the housing problem out there, that there are still going to be pockets of uh, areas where the housing values have dropped so much that it is still going to be tough for a lot of people, and we're just going to have to work our way through this as the economy improves. Mr. President, let's lighten things up for a minute. Uh, we got a lot of people just submitting their ideas to you. They had ideas for how to make the country better. They wanted to hear what you thought about them. Let's play sort of a faster round of a thing we'll call good idea, bad idea. I'll, okay. I'll show you an idea. All you right. say whether you think it's good or bad, and maybe just a few sentences about, about why right. you think that. Okay. First one comes from Aloha Tony, your home state of Hawaii. There he you says, go. Mr. President, our deficit is higher than ever at $12 trillion. Will you consider allowing the private sector to buy and take over the most troubled government-run agencies, such as the U.S. Postal Service? Uh, Bad idea most of the time. Um, there are examples where privatization makes sense, where people can do things much more efficiently. Um, but oftentimes what you see is companies want to buy those parts of a government-run operation that are profitable, mm -hmm. and they don't want to do anything else. So, for example, the, the U.S. Postal Service, uh, everybody uh, would love to have that high-end part of the business that FedEx and UPS are already in, uh, business to business, you make a lot of money, but do they want to deliver that postcard to a remote area mm -hmm. uh, uh, somewhere in uh, rural America that is a money loser? Well, the U.S. Post Office provides universal service. Those uh, companies would not want to provide universal service. So you've got to make sure that you look carefully at what uh, privatization proposals are out so there. So, bad idea most of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time. Next, ba next idea, rather, is a video. My car insurance company will allow me to take driver's ed classes to reduce my monthly premiums. Can we do the same thing for health insurance? Take classes in cooking, nutrition, stress management, communication, parenting, stopping smoking, uh, maybe even exercise classes, and get a reduction on our monthly premiums? Well, I, I think that the idea is a good one. Uh, and that is that if people are being uh, healthy, uh, that they should be able to get some incentives for that. And a lot of companies are starting to do that. Uh, we probably don't want the insurance companies, though, making those decisions because insurance companies have every incentive to take the youngest, healthiest people and insure them since they're less likely to have to pay out and then leave older, sicker individuals uh, out of their insurance pools. So it's important in any health care program to make sure that the young and the healthy and the older and, and the sicker are in a single pool. But what we should encourage are individual companies who provide incentives for wellness programs, smoking cessation programs, you know, that they're going to uh, get a workout once in a while. Those things are something that we should encourage. And you know, uh, the First Lady, Michelle Obama, she's really focusing right now on childhood wellness, healthy eating, getting exercise. That's a campaign that she's going to be pushing all year long. 
Let's get one more uh, idea in here. This next one comes from Jay Leavers in Dover, Delaware, who writes, Do you think it would be worth looking at placing solar panels on all federal, state, and school buildings as a way to cut energy costs and put that budget money to better use? Good idea. And we want to do everything we can to encourage clean energy. And I've, I have instructed the Department of Energy to make sure that our federal operations are employing the best possible clean energy technology, alternative energy technology. Uh, and what we're seeing is more and more companies realize this is a win-win for them. Not only uh, is what they're doing environmentally sound, but it also, uh, over the long term, saves money for them. Great. Well, let's move back to the questions. And i got to tell you, the number one question that came in in the jobs and economy category had to do with the Internet. Mm -hmm. And it came uh, from James Earlywine in Indianapolis. He said, an open Internet is a powerful engine for economic growth and new jobs. Letting large companies block and filter online content and services would stifle needed growth. What is your commitment to keeping the Internet open and neutral in America? Well, uh, I'm a big believer in net neutrality. Uh, I campaigned on this. Uh, I continue to be a strong supporter of it. My FCC chairman, uh, Julius Janikowski, uh, has indicated that he shares uh, the view that we've got to keep the Internet open, that we don't want to create a bunch of uh, gateways uh, that prevent somebody who doesn't have a lot of money but has a good idea from being able to start their next YouTube or their next Google on the Internet. So this is something we're committed to. We're getting pushback, obviously, from... Uh, some of the bigger carriers who would like to be able to charge uh, more fees and, and uh, extract more money from wealthier customers. Uh, but we think that uh, runs counter to the whole spirit of openness uh, that has made the Internet such a powerful engine for not only economic growth, but also for the generation of ideas and creativity. Well, you know, to get good jobs, I think many Americans realize they need a higher education. Mm -hmm. But college tuition costs are so high. Here is uh, a video question from Saginaw, Michigan. Dear President Obama, as a college student who has 14 credits and three part-time jobs, I uh, just was wondering, uh, what are your plans for um, to, plans to lower college tuition costs? Um, you know, I know we're in a struggling economy right now, um, but any any little bit that you can help would be appreciative. Thank you. God bless. Bye. Well, John's right that you know college tuition costs are just crushing on a lot of folks, and this is something I remember from my own experience because Michelle and I we had college loans we kept on paying off for a decade after we had graduated from law school. Uh, we've already done. Uh, a, a huge amount to increase Pell Grants, to, to help uh, increase uh, the accessibility of college loans and grants at the college level, but we want to do more. And so we've put forward uh, an initiative that is being debated in Congress, and we hope to get past this year, where if you uh, have student loans, that you will not have to pay more than 10 percent of your income on those loans, that after 20 years they'll be forgiven, and if you've gone into public service, they'll be forgiven after 10 years. That would provide a huge amount of relief for people. Uh, we still need to expand more uh, the Pell Grant program, make it both uh, accessible to more people and raise uh, the amount of tuition. In order to pay for this, the best part of this is we can actually figure out how to pay for it, because right now you've got a lot of banks and financial service companies who are still middlemen in the federally guaranteed loan programs. And if we can cut those middlemen out, then you've got several billion dollars that you can invest in the programs that I just described. Uh, this is something that uh, I've made a top priority. I want us to once again have the highest college graduation rates of any country in the world by 2020. We can get that done, uh, but this is legislation that needs to pass. and. The last point I would make, colleges uh, and universities also, though, have to figure out how can they cut their costs. Because even if we're putting more and more loans in, uh, more and more money for loans, if uh, uh, the inflation in higher education keeps on skyrocketing, over time uh, it's still going to gobble up all that extra money and we'll be right back where we started. So we've got to show uh, more restraint at the college and university level in terms of ever escalating costs. 
Well, let's back up a bit just from the specifics of education policy and ask a more fundamental question, which comes from Sean in Ohio. Mr. President, what do you want public education to help students become? Should they be good workers, innovative thinkers, something else? As a math teacher, I want to know what you think it means to be an educated person. Well, I think obviously there's a huge economic component to being well educated. Uh, we know that if you've got a college education, you're going to make uh, multiples of what you would make as a high school graduate, much less a high school dropout over the course of a lifetime. But uh, it's absolutely true that a high quality education is not just a matter of being a good worker, it's also a matter of being a good citizen, it's also a matter of being able to uh, think critically, uh, evaluate the world around you, uh, make sure that you can uh, process all the information that's coming at us uh, in, in a way that uh, helps you make decisions about your own life, but also helps you uh, participate in the life of the country. And you know, I, I'm a big believer that uh, the most important thing that a kid can learn in school is how to learn and how to think. Uh, if, if, you know, Malia and Sasha, my two daughters, are, are asking questions, know how to poke holes in an argument, know how to make an argument themselves, know how to evaluate a complicated uh, bunch of data, uh, then I figure that they're going to be okay regardless of the career path that they're in. And I think that that requires more than just rote learning, although uh, you know, it, it certainly requires good habits and discipline in school. Uh, it also requires that in the classroom uh, they're getting uh, the kind of creative teaching that's so important. And that's why uh, our administration's initiated something called Race to the Top, where uh, my Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, has helped to design a competition among states so that they can foster the kinds of uh, excellence in learning everywhere, not just in some schools, not just in some states, but in every school and every state. If states want money, we're going to reward excellence, and, if, uh, and, and we will show them you know, what has been proven to work in terms of encouraging the kind of critical thinking uh, that uh, all of our children need. Mr. President, the, the number two category after jobs and economy that people submitted to was national security and foreign policy. Uh, and the f number one question came from concerned conservative in Georgia who asked about your plans for the war on terror. And then Sean from Pennsylvania followed it up with, Dear, Dear President Obama, if we remove our troops from the war on terror, how will you continue to combat the threat of terrorism? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's important to understand that we are at war against a very specific group, Al-Qaeda and its extremist allies that have metastasized around the globe that would attack us, attack our allies, uh, attack bases uh, and embassies around the world, and most, most sadly, uh, attack innocent people, uh, regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of their religions. Uh, you know, Al-Qaeda is probably the biggest uh, uh, killer of innocent Muslims uh, of uh, any entity out there. And so, that is our target, and that is our focus. Now, they employ terrorist tactics, uh, but we need to cl be clear about uh, who, our, who our target is. Uh, and we have to fight them on all fronts. We have to fight them uh, in very concrete ways in Afghanistan and along the border regions of Pakistan where uh, they are still holed up. Uh, they have spread to places like Yemen and Somalia, and we are working internationally with uh, partners to try to uh, limit their scope of operations and dismantle them uh, in those regions. Uh, but we also have to battle them with uh, ideas. And we have to uh, help work with the overwhelming majority of Muslims who reject senseless violence of this sort uh, and to, to work to provide different pathways and different alternatives for people expressing uh, uh, whatever policy differences that they may have. And I think we haven't done as good of a job on that front. Uh, we have to project economically, working in countries uh, like a Yemen that is extraordinarily poor to make sure that young people there have opportunity. The same is true in a place like Pakistan. So uh, we want to use all of our national power 
to deal with uh, the problem of these extremist organizations. Uh, but part of that uh, does involve uh, applications of military power, and that's why, uh, although uh, it is the hardest decision that a commander-in-chief can make to send our troops into battle, I thought it was very important to make sure that we had uh, an additional 30,000 troops in Afghanistan to help train Afghan forces so that they uh, can start providing more effective security for their own country in dealing with the Taliban and ultimately allow us to remove our troops but still have a secure partner there uh, that's not going to be able to uh, use that region as a platform to attack the United States. Well, another central issue in the war on terror right now is Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. And a lot of users wrote in about this. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? I think we're going to... Well, it's not come later. I think the next question is actually about Sudan, which you didn't actually address in your State of the Union, but mm -hmm. uh, it was actually the number one voted question, and it's a video from uh, the Enough Project here in D.C. Mm -hmm. President Obama, more than three million Darfuris fear returning home because of instability. Many fear that Sudan may be on the brink of war. What will you do to galvanize the international community to ensure that widespread violence does not occur in Sudan this year? Well, the situation in Sudan has been heartbreaking but also extremely difficult and something that we started working on the day that I uh, came into office. Our first task was at that time making sure that people who were in refugee ca camps in Darfur uh, had access to basic water, food, other necessities of life. And this was after uh, the Sudanese government in Khartoum had kicked out a whole bunch of uh, non-governmental organizations that were providing assistance there. We were able to get that assistance back in to help it, at least initially stabilize the situation. The next step in the challenge is to broker a lasting peace agreement between rebels uh, who are still in the Darfur region and this, this government. And I've got a special envoy who has been very active in trying to bring together the international community to get that deal brokered. Part of what makes it complicated is you also have a conflict uh, historically between northern Sudan and southern Sudan. Uh, they finally reached a agreement after a lot of work, uh, but the Sudanese now, uh, the southern Sudanese now have an option where they may uh, be seeking to secede from all of Sudan. That's another potential conflict that could uh, create additional millions of refugees. And so what we are doing is trying to work with not only the regional powers, but the United Nations and other countries that have shown a great interest in this to see if we can broker a series of agreements that would stabilize the country and then allow the refugees who are in Darfur to start moving back uh, to their historic lands. Sadly, because of the genocide that took place earlier, a lot of those villages are now destroyed. Uh, and so thinking about how to resettle these populations in places that are viable economically, that have the resources to support populations, is a long-term development challenge that the international community is going to have to uh, support. We continue to put pressure on the Sudanese government. If they are not cooperative in these efforts, uh, then it is going to be appropriate for us to conclude that uh, engagement doesn't work and you know, we're going to have to uh, apply uh, additional pressure on Sudan in order to um, in order to achieve our objectives. But my hope is is that we can broker agreements with all the parties involved uh, to deal with what has been an enormous human tragedy in that region. You know, the question we missed from the, the deck, but it was, it was about uh, Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. It was essentially easier saying, uh, why is it taking so long to close down Guantanamo? Right. Well, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, number one, you've got a whole bunch of individuals in Guantanamo some of whom are very dangerous, some of whom were low-level fighters, uh, some of whom uh, the courts have determined should never have been put there in the first place. We've had to evaluate each of those cases, hundreds of cases, one by one, to determine what these various categories are uh, and do it in a way that uh, stands up to our standards of due process and, mm -hmm. and uh, legal scrutiny. Then uh, we've got to figure out if we're closing Guantanamo, where are we going to put them? And we have proposed 
uh, that uh, there are a number of options on the continental United States where you could uh, hold these people as trials either in military commissions or in Article III courts are pending. But unfortunately, there has been a lot of uh, political resistance and, uh, you know, frankly, uh, some of it just politically motivated. Uh, some of it people being legitimately scared about, well, if we've mm -hmm. got uh, somebody who uh, we've been told is a terrorist in our backyard, uh, will that make us target? Uh, one of the things that we've had to try to communicate to the country at large is that historically we've tried a lot of terrorists in our courts. We have them in our federal prisons. They've never escaped. Uh, and these folks are no different. But uh, it's been one of those things that's uh, been subject to a lot of, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, pretty uh, rank politics. And you know, we've got to work through that process because Congress ultimately controls the purse strings in creating new facilities. If Congress makes a decision that they are going to try to block uh, the opening of a new facility, it uh, potentially constrains what our administration can do. And so this is something that we've got to work through uh, in, both in Congress but also with public opinion so that people understand that ultimately this is the right thing to do. By closing Guantanamo, we can regain the moral high ground in the battle against these terrorist organizations. There's been no bigger propaganda uh, weapon for many of these extremists than pointing to Guantanamo and saying that we don't live up to our own ideals. And that's something that I strongly believe we have to resist, even if it has some costs to it and, and even if uh, it's not always the most politically popular thing to do. You know, Mr. President, uh, we don't have much time left, but I want to make sure we get to the issue of energy and mm -hmm. the environment. Right. Uh, one of the rare moments where you were able to get applause from your, your friends on the Republican side of the Iowa Congress the other night was when you mentioned nuclear energy. Yeah. Um, and just today, your budget announced uh, tripling the loan guarantees for nuclear reactors. Uh, a lot of people had questions about just how uh, this will work and, and why you did that. President Obama, record numbers of young people elected you in support of a clean energy future. If money is tight, why do you propose wasting billions in expensive nuclear, dirty coal, and offshore drilling? We need to ramp up efficiency, wind, and solar that are all economically sustainable and create clean and safe jobs for our generation. Well, you're not going to get uh, any argument uh from me about the need to create clean uh, energy jobs. I think this is going to be the driver of our economy over the long term. Uh, and so that's why we put in record amounts of money for solar and wind and biodiesel and all the other alternative uh, clean energy sources that are out there. In the meantime, though, unfortunately, no matter how fast we ramp up those energy sources, we're still going to have enormous energy needs uh, that will be unmet by alternative energy. And the question then is where, where uh, will that come from? Nuclear energy has the advantage of not emitting greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. For those who are concerned about climate change, we have to recognize that countries like Japan and France and others have been much more aggressive in their nuclear uh, industry and much more successful uh, in uh, having that a larger part of their portfolio without incident, without accidents. Uh, we're mindful of the concerns about storage, uh, of spent fuel, and concerns about security. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still think it's the right thing to do if we're serious about dealing with climate change. Uh, with respect to clean coal technology, uh, it, it is not possible at this point to completely eliminate coal from the menu of, of our energy options. And if we are ever going to deal with climate change in a serious way, where we know China and India are going to be greatly reliant on coal, we've got to start developing clean coal technologies that can sequester the harmful emissions uh, because otherwise countries like China and India uh, are not going to stop using coal. We'll still have those same problems, but we won't have the technology to make sure that it doesn't uh, harm the environment over the long term. So uh, I know that there's some skepticism about whether there is such a thing as clean coal technology. What is true is right now that we don't have all the technology to prevent <clears throat> greenhouse gas emissions from 
uh, uh, coal, uh, coal powered uh, mm -hmm. power plants, but uh, the technology is close and it makes sense for us to make that investment now, not only because it will be good for America, but it will also ultimately be good internationally. We can license and export that technology in ways that help other countries uh, uh, use uh, a better form of energy that's going to be uh, helpful to the climate change issue. Mr. President, I think we're out of time, but I, I know a lot of people really enjoyed the opportunity to ask questions of you in this way, and would love to do this again with you sometime. You know, this was terrific, and uh, I just want to thank everybody who, uh, who submitted questions, whether uh, via email or uh, over the Internet, and uh, I hope we get a chance to do this on a more regular basis because uh, it, it gives me great access to, to all the people out there with wonderful ideas. And even if you didn't make your question, uh, even if it wasn't on this show. Uh, we appreciate your submission, and hopefully we'll catch you next time. Great. Thanks, right. Mr. President. Thank you. Appreciate it.